Hi everybody, it's Katie Bailey and today we're going to discuss how to read a sinus CT. Our goals in this discussion to review sinus anatomy and variants on CT, to discuss the most common pathology, and to review red flags that should tell you something may be going on rather than just humdrum sinusitis. So the paranasal sinuses consist of the paired maxillary sinuses, the ethmoid air cells, which you have anterior and posterior ones, you just kind of divide it in half, the sphenoid sinus, which is posterior to the ethmoid air cells, and the frontal sinus, which is the most superior sinus. In discussion of the paranasal sinuses, you also discuss findings in the nasal cavity, as well as the orbits, due to their proximity to the sinus structures. When discussing the sinus, you evaluate the degree of aeration. This left maxillary sinus is well aerated. The right maxillary sinus is opacified with soft tissue density material. There's associated bony wall thickening, which usually is related to chronic sinusitis. You will also evaluate the sinus for wall thinning with a process such as a mucoseal, which opacifies and expands the sinus, or bone destruction, which suggests a more aggressive process. So this is what the bone should normally be, nice thin bone, aerated sinus. This is a completely opacified sinus with chronic bony wall thickening, which suggests a chronic sinusitis process. When you see a disease process involving the maxillary sinus, always evaluate the retromaxillary fat, that is the tergopalatine fossa, and Infiltration of that fat can be the earliest sign of an invasive sinusitis. So you want to make sure there's a normal fat plane dorsal to the maxillary sinus. The drainage of the maxillary sinus is the osteomatal complex, which is this narrow pathway extending supramedially from the maxillary sinus to the nasal cavity. The tip of that is the uncinate process. On this left side, there is a patent osteomatal complex. On the right side, you can see the proximal aspect of the osteomatal complex is obstructed. In the frontal sinus, you also discuss how aerated it is. So this is a well aerated frontal sinus. You look for areas of bony wall thickening, thinning or destruction as we discussed in the maxillary sinus. And the drainage of the frontal sinus is through the frontoethmoidal recesses. So a tract from the frontal sinus to the anterior ethmoid air cells. So you'd like to see a patent frontoethmoidal recess on both sides. Here you can see there's minimal mucosal thickening at those frontoethmoidal recesses. The ethmoid air cells, you discuss aeration. Is there mild mucosal thickening? Is it more anterior or posterior? Are there multiple opacified ethmoid air cells? Important variants include the Haller air cell, which is an inferoorbital ethmoid air cell because this can result in impaired drainage of the maxillary sinus as it changes the anatomy of that osteomatal complex. So you see this air cell between the orbit and the osteomatal complex and that's changing the geometry of that osteomatal complex and can relate to chronic obstruction. Here on the right side there is obstruction of that osteomatal complex. And remember when you look at the ethmoid air cells what's next to it? You have your orbit and you can have disease processes involving either that affect the other. So you can have an ethmoid sinusitis that causes a periosteal abscess in the orbit. You can have an orbital process that invades into the ethmoid air cells. For the sphenoid sinus, you also discuss the degree to which it is aerated, whether it contains fluid with a fluid level or meniscus, whether it's mucosal thickening, whether it's small polypoid foci of mucosal thickening. You evaluate for wall thickening, thinning, or destruction. Uh, the sphenoethmoidal recesses are difficult to see, but there is a drainage of the sphenoid sinus into the posterior ethmoid air cells. So if you have significant sphenoid sinus disease, a lot of times that's associated with posterior ethmoid sinus disease. And remember, when you have a disease process involving the sphenoid sinus, you have some very important structures around that sphenoid sinus. You have the internal carotid arteries. You have the cella, which is intimately associated with that sphenoid sinus. You have the clivus, and what sits right here behind the clivus, the basilar artery. So when you have significant disease involving the sphenoid sinus, all of these structures are at risk. The nasal cavity, you want to evaluate the nasal septum. Is it in the midline? 
Is it bowed to the right? Is there an associated nasal septal spur? You want to look at the nasal turbinates. You have superior, middle, and inferior turbinates, and there is a variance called a concha bullosa, or an aerated middle turbinate, that can contribute to osteomyital complex dysfunction. So here's an aerated middle turbinate, or a concha bullosa, on the right. You can get nasal polyposis, which is polypoid soft tissue density material within the nasal cavity. I like to confirm this on the sagittal view because you can separate this soft tissue from the adjacent turbinates. If you have mucosal thickening of the turbinates, you can confuse it for polyposis, but I like the sagittal view because it shows that polyp is separate from the nasal turbinates. So these are the anatomic variants that I discuss in every sinus CT to help our ENT friends. The optic nerve canals run along the lateral superior aspect of the sphenoid sinus. There is a variant, which is rare, but you will see it, where there's no bony covering of the medial wall of that optic nerve canal. So in every study that I look at, I make sure there is a bone that is covering the medial aspect of that optic canal. If those optic canals do not have a bony covering, then our ENT friends need to be careful in the sphenoid sinus to make sure if they're removing mucosa that they don't disrupt the optic nerves. So I will say normal course of the optic nerves to identify that there's a normal bony covering medially of the optic nerve canals along the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. The olfactory fossa, you measure this from the medial lamella of the orbit, which is where the roof meets the medial wall, to the Cristagalli. And then at this point, you're measuring the depth of that olfactory fossa. So there's a Kiros classification. Kiros type 1 is less than 4 millimeters deep, and that's this. Kiros type 2 is between 4 and 7 millimeters deep. So you're measuring from a line drawn here to the bottom of that olfactory fossa. And then a Kiros type 3 is greater than 7 millimeters deep. So that would be a line measured across here, and you measure both sides of the olfactory fossa. So Kiros type 1, less than 4 millimeters. Kiros type 2, 4 to 7 millimeters. Kiros type 3, greater than 7 millimeter depth of the olfactory fossa. The vidian nerve canal. The vidian nerve is formed by the greater superficial petrosal nerve and deep petrosal nerve. So it has parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers that control secretions of the eye and the nose. To find this, you go to a coronal view, you look for those pterygoid plates, and you look for a little foramen just above them. So this is normal appearance of the vidian nerve canal. It should be safe within the bone. This is a superficial positioning of the vidian nerve canal. It's on a little stalk and it's not covered by bone and not safe. So if this patient had severe sinus disease and was having surgery, you can imagine how easy it would be to whack that if you couldn't see it hidden underneath the mucosa. So there's normal and then there's superficially positioned. The carotid canals can be normally positioned where they're safe from the aerated sphenoid sinus, or they can be medially positioned where you have aerated sphenoid sinus around it, and they're more susceptible to injury because you just have this thin bone between the sphenoid sinus and the carotid canal. When I discuss the sphenoid sinus, I discuss how many bony septa are present, and they have to connect anteriorly to posteriorly. So this would be one bony sphenoid septum that attaches in the midline. This would be a bony sphenoid septum that attaches along the lateral wall in the sphenoid sinus. Red flags on sinus imaging. If you have abnormal soft tissue or abnormal stranding within that retromaxillary fat in the PPF, that is an early indicator of invasive sinusitis and a lot of times invasive fungal sinusitis. So you'd like to see that nice fat plane behind the maxillary sinus. You do not want to see soft tissue and stranding in there. In that same patient, you can see there's circumferential mucosal thickening and fluid in the maxillary sinus, but you see stranding inferiorly in the orbit, inferior to the inferior rectus muscle. Another reason to think invasive sinusitis, and here's that bony defect on bone windows. In the nasal cavity, you look for bone destruction. So here you can see the nasal bone is present on the right side. There's soft tissue there, but the bone is absent. On the coronal view, you can see there's disruption of the bone. So destruction of the bone suggests a more aggressive process, which is a red flag to look for tumor or aggressive infection.
So don't forget when you're reading a sign of CT to look at everything else included on your images and that's dependent on the place that you uh, work. You can include portion of the posterior fossa, the cella, the nasopharynx, the temporomandibular joints, the maxillary teeth, sometimes mandibular, the orbits, the parotid glands, and the oral cavity. Don't forget to look at everything on your images because you are responsible for them. Thank you for your time. Thanks to everyone for tuning in to this overview of a search pattern for sinus CT. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you like this video, be sure to check out some of the other search patterns which we have for head CT, brain MRI, and other things like that. Those are all available on the channel as well as on the website, learnerradiology.com. Thanks for watching today. Be sure to like and uh, subscribe to the channel. Thank you.